Well, thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to be here. Uh, we've got a world of topics to discuss, literally. And so let's uh, get right to the presentation. Okay, the, this presentation is entitled Our Plant Positive Future with No Time Left to Lose. Both those topics are going to be recurring themes in this presentation. As you may be aware, I have been spending the majority of my uh, waking hours going around to the medical schools of uh, North America, but also Australia, New Zealand, Europe, uh, and talking to the medical students, giving them uh, the most important message I think they need to hear, uh, namely, um, the majority of diseases that they are seeing that spending most of their professional time on obesity, high blood pressure, clogged arteries, uh, inflammatory diseases of lung, uh, gut, skin, etc. It uh, turns out that uh, most doctors are focused on managing these diseases, managing chronic illness. Uh, but actually, the truth is these are reversible diseases. If we get these uh, people on a diet based on whole plant foods and uh, healthy up their lifestyle, get enough sleep, exercise, etc., cetera, uh, these diseases go away. They reverse. I wish someone had told me that uh, when I was a medical student. I wish I had known it would have changed the entire course of my medical career. So I'm imparting this message uh, to medical students uh, wherever I find them, both in person and now uh, electronically on Zoom. Uh, and the message is, listen, a whole food plant-based diet is square one. You want to reverse these diseases. You have to do other things, but basically run this fuel mixture through your patient's body for the next 90 days and see if you don't feel better. Almost certainly you absolutely will. Uh, and as we do so, the changes are just remarkable. Obesity begins to melt away, uh, arteries relax, high blood pressures come down, sore joints stop hurting, uh, asthmatic lungs stop wheezing so much, migraine headaches get better, uh, the psoriatic skin clears up, the uh, uh, colitis and Crohn's symptoms start to subside. The people turn into normal, healthy people right before our eyes. It's the most exciting transformation in medicine. And uh, here's uh, Dr. Furman's patient, Emily. I know her well. Uh, and she used to look like the Emily on the left. Uh, she was grossly diabetic on 30 units of insulin on two medications for blood pressure. She went on a whole food plant-based diet. 11 months later, she lost almost 100 pounds. She also lost her diabetes and high blood pressure. Uh, she now has normal blood values, uh, blood sugars, blood pressures. And I tell the young students, what greater gift could you want to help your patients achieve? Uh, isn't this why we went into medicine? You know, if you want to, do you want to heal these patients or don't you? If you do, then let's get real about why they are sitting in front of us, doctor, overweight, hypertensive, clogged up, inflamed, largely from the standard American diet, the meat, the dairy, the oils, the sugars that they're running through their tissues every four hours. Well, when we stop doing that and get a truly healthy diet, a plant-based diet flowing through their tissues, uh, the changes are just spectacular. It's the highest level healing, the most powerful therapeutic tool I can imagine. And this is the message that I've been bringing to the medical students. <clears throat> However, even though I'm talking about arteries and blood pressures and inflammatory reactions, the back of my head and the depths of my heart, I have another patient in mind. Actually, it's the, my biggest patient of all, uh, and that is planet Earth. I am a passionate environmentalist, and I have been very concerned to the point of grieving for what is happening to planet Earth, and I want to share that uh, with you during this presentation. Now, when I was a boy in the 1950s, I spent most of my summers on my uncle's dairy farm in northern Wisconsin, and it was a wonderland. Uh, I would uh, milk the cows and drive tractors, sling hay bales, etc. But as every chance I could, I would slip off into the forest. And in those cathedrals of trees, I felt at home. There was such truth there. There was such beauty there. There was such the stillness uh, that it made me 
very aware of being a natural man on this planet, a, uh, a being of nature like the animals that I saw. And my world was full of animals then, hawks and and salamanders and uh, uh, deer and foxes and frogs and mink. Uh, and uh, of course, the domestic animals on the farm, the cows, the dogs, the cats. And how I love the water, every chance I get, I would slip into our canoe and glide across uh, the many lakes in the area. Now, th I, I let the natural world just flow through me. It imbued every fiber of my being. I realize this is my true home, that we are creatures of this earth. And I would spend many hours alone walking through the forest and the trees uh, would, would share with me their stately message of rightness, of, of it is so proper that they are just where they are, manifesting fully as they are. And, and that's their message to me uh, as, a, as a man. They were saying, be fully who you are, wherever you are, be fully there and manifest your truth as fully as possible. And so I developed this deep love for the earth and, and, and seeing its naturalness uh, in the the flow of energy, water always flows downhill. The clouds move across the skies and bring their life-giving rains. There's just such rightness to the natural world. How could one not love it? And then in my late 20s, I became a pilot. Uh, I fly airplanes. I love being up in the air. I would fly every day if I could. I just love being in that left-hand seat. Aviation is so pure and so truthful and so soul-expanding, and it expands our, uh, our vision and understanding of the natural world. But that said, it didn't take me many hours in the air to look down and see something that made my heart ache. From 8,000 feet in the left-hand seat, you can see what we are doing to this planet. And I was in Northern California, and I looked down, and I saw we were scalping the, the forests off the mountainsides. And with no tree roots to hold the soils, the soils would cascade down into the river bottoms, and I would see the rivers running brown with topsoil and after we've cleaved off the forest cover. I saw the rivers running dry uh, as the waters were siphoned off for uh, irrigating alfalfa and uh, cattle uh, water uh, installations. And as toxins are building up in our ecosystems, I would see again and again evidence of entire ecosystems sickening and dying. And then how can anyone uh, aware of the plight of the earth, not to understand that we are cleaving off the rainforest uh, in South America, the very lungs of the earth. And as a result, the deserts of the planet are encroaching all over. <clears throat> and I look at my beloved planet earth through the eyes of a physician. And I say, you know, if, if this was a medical patient, she is in trouble. She's running a fever. The temperature is going up. Um, her uh, arteries are clogged up. Her, the rivers that circulate around are clogged and polluted. The digestive powers of her soils are being diminished as we poison them with herbicides and pesticides, killing off any life that may com compete with the crops that we're grazing. And the lungs of the earth, as I mentioned, the forests, we are cleaving them off in order to make grazing land and cropland for beef. We, the, as a result, well, the carbon dioxide levels are going up just like a patient in respiratory uh, failure. This patient with a fever and clogged arteries and failing lungs uh, should be in the intensive care unit. She is certainly worthy of intensive care. And that's what I want to talk to you about because all of us are responsible for her intensive care. A lot of people are expressing alarm. Uh, here's uh, J. Morris Hicks, uh, Jim Hicks. I urge you to subscribe to his Healthy Eating, Healthy World uh, newsletter. He's got so many brilliant insights and ideas for action. And though we've been focusing on human health throughout this magnificent conference, let me just 
underline a basic truth. It doesn't matter what your cholesterol level is. If we don't have a viable planet to live on, and that trumps everything, that, that uh, it's got to take precedence uh, in all our future planning, starting with what you're having for dinner tonight. The rate of global warming is increasing. And as a result, the ice caps are melting. We'll be talking about that. But you can see it from space. You, you can see is what the ice caps looked like in 1979. Here they were 30 years later. Clearly, as the Earth is getting warmer, the ice caps are melting. And these poor bears, um, these melting icebergs are there because of us. And with every rainstorm, as I mentioned, the soils of Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Missouri are washing into the rivers uh, of this continent and they're carried downstream. We are plumbing, so every rainstorm the, makes the rivers run brown with topsoil. And if you were standing at New Orleans where the Mississippi River flows out into the Gulf of Mexico, you should know that prime American topsoil from the Midwest is flowing past you into the sea at the rate of a dump truck load a second. And this is irreplaceable soil. This is where we and our children are gonna be growing our foods and we are squandering it, pouring it into the ocean, literally. And because all this soil is loaded with ammonia fertilizers, uh, as the nutrient rich or the fertilizer rich water in the rivers flows out into the Gulf of Mexico, it fosters a massive bloom of algae. They love all those phosphates and nitrates, but then the river, the, the ocean turns green with algae blooms and then those algae die. And as they die, they suck oxygen out of the water to the point where there is a hypoxic zone the size of the state of Maryland uh, off the coast of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico. Nothing lives there. And we've been absolutely brutal in what we've done with the land we found here 200 years ago. The majority of land where we are growing crops used to be forests. Uh, Illinois, Ohio, Minnesota, these were thickly forested lands. It said before the white man cut down the trees, a squirrel in Maine could jump up in a tree and jump from tree to tree to tree to tree and not set foot on the ground till they came out in the grasslands of Iowa. That's how thick the tree cover was. But what did we do? We cut all these trees down and we are proceeding to poison the land with our chemicals. And the creatures who used to live there are suffering an absolutely catastrophic, catastrophic decimation of their homes and their numbers. This brief video clip tells that story. Sorry, Dr. Clapper, I need to interrupt you for a second. Can you pause the video? Can you hear this? Uh, can, can you um, stop sharing and then share one more time and just hit the, uh, the optimize for video clip and share audio? Okay, audience? sorry about that. Um, so I have to stop share and uh, then go back to, um, to screen share. That's what I was afraid of. Sorry about that. Um, so I go back to screen share. And now I will click share sound and optimize video clip, share that again. And uh, hopefully you will be able to hear this this time. Um, let me, uh, okay, wrong, no, I don't want that one, don't want that one. Um, oh boy. Uh, <clears throat> Move this here. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and then uh, you can also uh, hit more than hide. Uh, I'm sorry, media. say again? Yeah, hide floating meeting controls. All right, yeah, and I will hide the meeting controls here. My name is Silesh Rao, and Perfect. I'm one of the original engineers of the internet. Can you hear that? Yes. Good. In 2014, researchers at the World Wildlife Fund released a report saying that between 1970 and 2010, 
In just 40 years, the population of wild vertebrates decreased by 52%. Then two years later, they released the second report saying that between 1970 and 2012, the population of wild vertebrates decreased by 58%. So from these two data points, you can perform a simple math calculation to tell you that the current rate of decline, 100% of wild vertebrates will be gone by 2026. This is year zero, the year when all wild animals are gone. It turns out that animal agriculture is not only the number one source of carbon emissions, it is also the number one source of land use on the planet. All over the world, humans are destroying original forests to make room for grazing animals or to grow crops for feeding animals. And then humans are using sophisticated geolocating technology to locate the last remaining schools of fish. And finally, we are pouring all these toxins into the environment, which is killing insects, and which kills the birds which eat those insects. So we are attacking wild animals on land, in the ocean, and in the air. And this leaves wild animals no room to survive. We did some calculations. We took all the land that is currently being used for animal agriculture and restored the native forests that were there on that land in 1800. And it turns out not only that you could sequester more carbon than we have added to the atmosphere since 1750, but you also restore the natural habitat for wild animals to live. Is there a world too? So this is entirely possible. We can bring back the forests and we can heal the climate. And in the process, ensure that year zero never becomes a reality. So, indeed, and that's going to be what the rest of this talk is about. It's so profound. Who knew? When I was growing up, I did not realize that the farm animals on my uncle's farm had displaced so many of the creatures that were there. Here we are, as where Dr. Rao is telling us we're going to be going in the year 2026, just four years from now. This is the mass, the just the biomass of creatures on the pl on the planet and what we're doing with them. First of all, these are the human, uh, just a population of humans, they're sheer biomass compared to the wild animals on the on the planet. We have there's far more humans uh, just by biomass than than wild animals. And here are the animals we are growing in order to kill and eat. They far outweigh the, the wild animals. And here's all the food that we are growing on the land that used to be the animal's home. This is what we have done in order to satisfy our voracious appetite for animal flesh. This is what we've done to the natural world. And as he implied, every year, you know, well, on land, we killed, now it's up to 80 billion cows, pigs, chickens, ducks, goats, uh, we, we cut their throats every year and kill 80 billion land animals uh, in 2000, now this is up to 80 now. And one to three trillion creatures from the sea. Now every uh, piece of wild caught fish uh, really has behind it dozens of animals that were caught in those nets, the whales and turtles and sharks and rays and dolphins, uh, they're killed off as bykill, uh, and they contribute to this one to three trillion sea animals every year. 
And if you haven't seen it, I urge you to see a film called Sea Spiracy. They make it very clear what we are doing to the oceans, how badly we are plundering them. <clears throat> We've used fishing up. It's, let's start with this. Uh, no matter what role that fishing played throughout human history, and how we thought it was our natural right to scoop out all the fish uh, out of the ocean. Well, all populations of fish are now crashing. There's few of them left. And it's time to let the fish off the hook. It's time to let the oceans heal. We, we've used fishing up. We've, just, we've used it up. It's gotten us this far. Now we owe the oceans time to restore themselves. So let's call it for what it is. The majority of environmental destruction on the planet today is from large scale industrial animal agriculture. That's why they're cutting down the forest. Most soils are eroding off corn and soybean fields to feed the animals. Most water is used not by cities, but it's used to irrigate alfalfa, corn and soybeans across the continent. Most water is polluted with manure, herbicides, and pesticides from animal agriculture. As you just heard, most species are being driven to extinction by us taking their land and uh, growing animal fodder on it. And the majority of gases that are being released that are warming our planet, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, are coming from animal agriculture. And we'll be talking about these individual gases. But these 80 billion creatures, they're all breathing out carbon dioxide. They're all belching out methane. They are eating grains that have been raised with ammonia fertilizers, and that, that radiates nitrous oxide into the air. So large-scale animal agriculture is, is the main driving force for global warming and the rest of our environmental destructive uh, uh, processes here. And uh, Greta's pretty upset, and I don't blame her. And I imagine she's even more upset since the war in Ukraine is now taking our, our attention away from the global threat that we all faced. And in fact, of course, how much carbon dioxide is being put into the air uh, from, the, from the tanks and trucks and, and uh, the atrocious waste that war generates. But that's another topic. Now, we're warming the planet. It's not like we weren't warned. And I'm going to show you a clip that I remember seeing in real time when I was a boy back in 1958. I used to love science programs and I saw this one and I'll share it with you. This is the Bell Telephone Science Hour. <laughs> What would happen if we could change the course of the Gulf Stream or the other great ocean currents or warm up Hudson Bay with atomic furnaces? Extremely dangerous questions, because with our present knowledge, we have no idea what would happen. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun. Our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. This is bad? Well, it's been calculated that a few degrees rise in the Earth's temperature would melt the polar ice caps. And if this happens, an inland sea would fill a good portion of the Mississippi Valley. Tourists in glass-bottom boats would be viewing the drowned towers of Miami through 150 feet of tropical water. Foreign weather, we're not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. 1958, 60 years ago, we were warned. <clears throat> In 1986, I read this book that changed my life. John Robbins wrote Diet for a New America. If you haven't read it, I urge you to do so. And he made it very clear what 
large scale industrial animal agriculture is doing to planet Earth. I became good friends with John Robbins and we founded an organization called Earth Save in order to get this message out to the public. And here we are uh, with um, our friend, the late uh, River Phoenix back in 1986. We were trying to get people to see that evolving our diets to a plant-based one is the main thing we need to do in order to save our future. <clears throat> Back then, uh, the first Earth Day happened, 1972. I was in medical school at that time, and I remember the urgency that people were expressing, and yet they didn't make the connection between environmental destruction and their diet. Well, my friendship with John Robbins has lasted over the year. We're still good friends um, 40 years later, but people did not heed our message. No matter how loudly we, just, we trumpeted uh, the message. And I remember saying, because I was reading the, uh, the predictions back in 1990, that we got 10 years to, to reverse what we're doing that's driving global warming. And I began saying, listen, that's a, uh, 10 years, 120 months. Let's see, uh, it's been a month since I read it. 119 months we have back in 1990, I thought, uh, to reverse uh, what we were doing to warm the planet. Well, they didn't listen, of course. And that those 120 months shot by and uh, brought us to 2000. Uh, and uh, many, many more months have gone by. And uh, we have absolutely uh, not heeded uh, the warnings that we've been trying to, pr to promulgate. And as a result, uh, the earth has proceeded to warm just like we knew it would. And uh, we're now getting 100 degree temperatures in Siberia. And we're still not understanding that the main problem is us cutting down the forest. Humans have been deforesting the earth to fuel their civilization since civilization began. And, and we've basically cut down half the trees on planet earth. There used to be 6 trillion trees on planet earth. We're now down to less than 3 trillion. Uh, and I urge you to go to climatehealers.org, uh, see their fact sheet, but also join that noble organization. So why is the land cleared? Dr. Rao told us basically to grow animals for their animal flesh or to feed, grow the food to feed the animals in order to uh, kill them and eat their flesh. Now, when forest is burned for pasture, for of course, the carbon in the wood is emitted into the air as carbon dioxide. But the real ongoing sin, if you will, is that, that those trees are no longer there to do what trees do best, which would be to save our lives from due to one biological fact, that is trees take carbon dioxide out of the air and they turn it into solid wood. <laughs> okay, you wanna reverse global warming? Uh, they're building these multi-billion dollar mechanical devices to suck carbon dioxide out of the air. So I wanna point out that Mother Nature I came up with the ultimate carbon sequestration device millions of years ago, they're called trees. Uh, and the tree, the forest coming back and the trees growing and turning carbon dioxide in the air into solid wood really is our salvation. But when you cut down the forest and then plant corn and soybeans for animal fodder, the chance for that land to you know, sequester carbon is lost. Rainforest is being cleared at the rate of a football field a second, 4,000 acres every hour. And to keep the forest from coming back, they are burned. And what you're looking at is a NASA satellite image of fires that are acti actively burning at this moment, uh, across the, certainly across the tropical areas, but in, you, here's the Southern US and South America, across Africa, Asia, uh, we are burning the forest to keep them from coming back. And of course, uh, releasing carbon dioxide as we burn them. More greenhouse gases have been emitted from land use change than from the burning of fossil fuels. People are saying, oh, get those trucks off the road, solar panels, electric cars. Um, the problem is just clearing the land and burning the trees. 240 billion tons 
that those are 240 gigatons of carbon dioxide has been released since the white man came to North America and started cutting down the trees. Now this number, 240 gigatons, is not meant to make your eyes glaze over. Um, it's an important and actually a hopeful number because though the temperature is increasing and permafrost is melting and releasing more methane, <laughs> um, the trees hold uh, the key to our salvation. Now people say, wait a minute. Yeah, the animal agriculture is you know, playing a role here, but what about all the trucks on the road? What about all the cars on the road? Uh, I say that that is a false dichotomy there. When you, instead of blaming the trucks, uh, we, and the truck drivers are innocent. No, there's no bad guys here, but uh, the, the transportation is not a separate issue. Man, you uh, can understand that uh, by answering one question, what's in the trucks? Mm -hmm. The entire agriculture industry is in those trucks, the entire farming industry, the restaurant industry is in those trucks, the fast food industry is in those trucks. They are filled with fuel and machinery and parts and fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides and cattle field. And of course, the billions of cows and pigs and chickens we see on the highway, they're full of meat being refrigerated. The restaurant industry is in those trucks. The meat industry has its tentacles into every aspect of our environmental problems and how much of the, of the gasoline diesel fuel is being burned right now to promote meat, uh, uh, meat production. Uh, think about all those vast farms in Iowa, and Illinois, and Wisconsin. Think of all the tractors and trucks on those farms. They're all burning diesel fuel. All the irrigation pumps in order to, to grow all that alfalfa, corn, soybeans, especially out in the arid areas in Oklahoma, et cetera, the, they're burning diesel fuel for that. Think of all the coal and oil being burned to generate electricity to keep meat cold, to run the millions of refrigerators and freezers in, in this country, the slaughterhouses, the restaurants. This fossil fuel burning is not just a matter of buying an electric car. Do, can we not see that our voracious appetite for animal flesh is one of the main driving forces making all those fossil fuels be burned? <laughs> So I look at every child that I see and I'm, I feel, feel like running up to them and apologizing. And are we trading their future for so-called cheap cheeseburgers? But how cheap are they really if it's going to cost them their ability to have a livable planet? There's soon gonna be eight billion human beings on this planet. How are we going to feed them? And every four seconds, one of them dies of hunger. How, Totally preventable. We are growing enough food to feed every child on this planet, and yet we're letting one of them die every four seconds because the land they should be using to grow their own food is being used to grow animal fodder or beef cattle that are shipped up to the wealthy countries uh, uh, for their, quote, cheap cheeseburgers. <clears throat> so... Um, <clears throat> Now, as Dr. Rao and I are saying, it's one thing to cut down the forest and burn them, but as I mentioned, we perpetuate and compound the problem by keeping these lands in forest lands and, and cropland instead of letting the forest come back. The earth is on fire. What are we doing about it? Well, let's alert the children. Yeah, and yeah, don't kid yourself. Here's the Environmental Protection Agency's website for kids at school. What you can do, um, basically, see if uh, look around your classroom, see if uh, you can put in better insulation around the windows there, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, recycle cans. You know, it's the main driving force. What those kids are being served in the lunchroom is never mentioned. <clears throat> So these are the problems. What are the answers? Where lies hope? As Francis Moore LePay says, hope doesn't come from calculating whether good news is winning over bad news. Hope is simply a choice to take action. That is the antidote for our despair. So where lies hope? What actions can you take? Three things we can all do, educate ourselves, transform our buying and eating habits, and then organize to magnify uh, the power we have to make things better. So let's talk about educating ourselves. 
the simple fact that holds the key to our salvation is this. Since feeding humans directly with whole plant foods is so much more efficient than growing and feeding grains and feeding them to animals and then slaughtering and eating the animals, because most of the energy in those grains is one, passed out the back end of the animal in manure, or is burned off in the heat from the animal just walking around, or it's turned into inedible body parts, into a hair and hide and bones and blood and things that people don't eat. Uh, just a tiny amount turns into animal flesh that people consume. <clears throat> and as a result, a transition to a predominantly plant-based diet and their food sources could feed all the 9 billion people who are gonna be on earth in 2050. We can feed them a nourishing diet on about a quarter of the current land. All right, let's put it graphically here. <clears throat> to feed one person, the standard American diet with meat at every meal requires two football fields of land and the energy, uh, the water, electricity, et cetera, uh, every year, okay? But two football fields. Those same two football fields, if they are, were planted in grains and beans and fruits and vegetables could feed 14 people, okay? So if everyone in the world ate a plant-based diet, 5 billion football fields worth of land could be returned to forests. So what would happen if the world went plant-based overnight, the world's people? Mm -hmm. Well, we'd have no need for animals or their food. That would free up a land area the size of Africa. Let that sink in for a minute. And only 20% of this land would be needed to grow food. <clears throat> Therefore, of the remaining three-fourths of the current crop land, and pasture land, not growing food for people, let the forest come back on that. And as the tree grows, as the trees grow, they take carbon out of the air. That's all we need to do. Evolve our diets to a plant-based one and let the trees grow back. It's called rewilding. We, you know, we have perpetrated the greatest theft on the natural world. Well, now we tie, it's time to do reparations. You know, like the jewel thief, you know, drops off the, the, the diamond bracelet, you know, a week later out of guilt. We need to do the same thing here and then drop back the jewels of the natural world called the forest and the waters. And here's, here's why it works. <clears throat> As you might remember that I mentioned that since uh, we homo sapiens been cutting down the trees and burning them, we've released 240 gigatons, those are billions of tons, 240 gigatons into the earth, into the atmosphere since 1750. Well, if we go to a plant-based diet and let those forests come back on just half the land, uh, the, the, you know, remember the African sign, you know, you know only 20% to grow land. Um, if, if only half the land is dedicated back to forests, that will sequester 265 gigatons. That's way more than the 240 gigatons that we're, we, we've released into the air by cutting down the forest. So it works. All we need to do is let those lands now devoted to growing animal flesh let, let them now grow trees. As the trees grow, global warming gets reversed and we have a rosier future. These numbers and ideas show us that the physics and biology exists to, to permit all of us on earth to thrive nutritionally by rapidly evolving our diets to predominantly plant-based ones. All we need is the societal understanding of the desirability, actually the necessity of this transformation and the political will to do it. So, number one, we got to start educating ourselves. If you've not seen videos called Cowspiracy and Seaspiracy, please see them. If you have not read a book called Comfortably Unaware, which I'll show you in a minute, get that book and read it. I urge you to go to the website of climatehealers.org and join them and go to Extinction Rebellion and uh, educate yourself on that powerful message that they share. And join Jim Hicks's uh, Four Leaf program. It's a really simple, direct way to get people you love to consider uh, changing their diet to a plant-based one.
Now, I mentioned uh, Comfortably Unaware by Dr. Richard Oppenlander, such a powerful book. Go to his website, comfortablyunaware.com, see the videos there, uh, but read this magnificent book that will lay out the parameters in no uncertain terms. And if you don't have time to read Dr. Oppenlander's book, please, Glenn Mercer did us such a favor by creating this little book, 60 pages. You can read it in two hours. They're called Food is Climate. And he makes such a powerful argument uh, to the standard platitudes for reversing global warming, electric cars, solar panels, the things that Al Gore and Bill Gates and Paul Hawken are all promoting. Uh, none of them are really serious about the underlying driving problem here. Uh, Glenn Mercer cuts <laughs> and pulls no punches uh, as he makes it very clear. I urge you, get this little book and read it. So my message is the time to stop eating animals has come. We have used it up. And as Oppenlander and Merzer make very clear, all other plans to mitigate climate change are doomed to fail. And so are we, if we don't include the cessation of producing, uh, the cessation of producing and eating animals. Say it really, I think Dr. Oppenlander said, look, you can put solar panels on every, everyone's houses. You can give everybody an electric car. We'll make zero difference if we continue to eat a meat-based diet. Right, let me make that clear. You can put solar panels on everybody's house. You can give everyone an electric car. We'll make zero difference. The planet will continue to heat. The ice caps will continue to melt. Uh, the, the permafrost will continue to burn uh, unless we change our diet. We've used animal eating up. Mahatma Gandhi says, be the change you want to see in the world. Okay, It really comes down to transforming ourselves. So uh, go to climatehealers.org and uh, join that organization. And Dr. Rao's message is to us, it's time for us to change our entire role on this planet. We have been the conqueror, the plunderer, the predator. Whatever we want, we cut it down, we kill it, we take it. Uh, we've been a predator species, homo sapiens. We now have to transform ourselves into the caretaker species, <clears throat> homo ahimsa, life of nonviolence. Um, you know, it's uh, the people who use the Bible as the uh, justification. We can do whatever we want. We have dominion over the animals. I would just point out that dominion comes from the same Latin root, dominus, uh, as domestic, your house, your household. The animals are guests in our house. We're, we're supposed to take care of them, not kill them and eat them. You wouldn't kill and eat your house guests. Uh, we don't want to uh, be killing and eating the animals. It's time for us to transform to the caretaker species. If we do, instead of going extinct, we will transform and nonviolence should become uh, the norm. If we do, everything will begin to get better. The forests will return. As they do, they turn carbon dioxide into solid wood. The soils will, start, will stabilize and start replenishing themselves. They won't keep running into the rivers. The rivers will then run clean again. The oceans will begin to heal. They have tremendous regenerative properties if we allow them. Global warming will begin to reduce. Global hunger should disappear. We'll be able to grow more than enough plant-based food for everyone. And since lack of food and water are the driving forces for most wars, that can cease. Suffering and starvation can cease. Everything will get better, but it starts with Homo sapiens transitioning their diet to a plant-based one. It's not too late. It's not too difficult. Oh, that's such a difficult. We're talking about choosing the bean chili instead of the beef chili. You know, that's the huge <laughs> sacrifice we're being asked to make here. If you've not seen a film called Forks Over Knives, please do so. You will see people transforming before your very eyes from being overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up and inflamed to becoming lean and healthy with, with free of disease um, for the simple expediency of adopting a plant-based diet right before your eyes.
Then after you've seen the film, go back to the Forks Over Knives website. They've got wonderful transition plans. They've got recipes and transition plans to take you by the hand and help you transition. If you've not seen a film called Game Changers, see, I know so many people, I don't want to go vegan. They're all skinny. I don't want to lose my manly power. Uh, it turns out that a plant-based diet uh, will fuel superb athletic performance in the human body. And you certainly don't need to eat a bull to be as strong as one. Ask any buffalo, any giraffe, any elephant uh, that you can grow magnificent uh, mammalian muscles on a plant-based diet. And if those of you who have this, any anxiety about your musculature on a plant-based diet, I ask you to behold these magnificent specimens. Do any of these people look protein deficient to you? Um, I, I know most of them personally, and uh, uh, their, various, their, their very physical natures uh, communicate the message uh, that you don't have to be to eat a bull to be as strong as one. For the health professionals, please educate yourselves about these issues and how plant-based nutrition is the premier dietary and therapeutic tool that you can uh, uh, offer to your patients. Uh, go to these websites. Go to the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Uh, we've got lots of free CME there. Uh, go to Jeff Novick, uh, Vegan Dietitian's website. Definitely become a regular visitor to Dr. Greger's nutritionfacts.org. Uh, PCRM has a 21-day Kickstarter, so does uh, Rochester Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, Ginny, uh, Ginny Messina's uh, Vegan RD is a great website. Please, Dr. McDougall's newsletter is an education in itself. Uh, subscribe to his newsletter, read uh, all his relevant ones to you. You'll, it's an education in itself. Dr. Furman offers a great nutrition course. Uh, vegan dietitian uh, uh, Vasanto Molina's NutriSpeak is a wonderful website. The University of Winchester has a six-week online course in applied plant-based nutrition. I think I have a slide on that. Take that course. I took it and learned a ton. Go to my website, drclaber.com, see my video, Thriving on a Plant-Based Diet. <clears throat> so educate yourself. Then transform yourself like I have. I base most every decision and by every purchase I make, every airline ticket I buy, and every conversation I have to, I compare it to the standards, is this going to result in fewer animals being eaten? I will not make a purchase, will not get on an airplane unless the total, the, unless the, the result of those actions are going to be fewer animals being eaten. So use your purchase power. That's when people say, well, I've got no power. Yes, you do. Every time you pull that wallet out and pull that credit card out, you are changing the world. You are making a statement. And it starts with the food you order at the restaurant and what you put in your shopping cart at home. <clears throat> so I invite you to join uh, the True Health Initiative, Dr. David Katz and his crew at THI for No Beef Week. It starts this Monday from April 18th through the 24th. The global demand for beef is the leading driver of deforestation in the Amazon. Vow for this week and hopefully long term after that, that you're going to eat no beef uh, this week. Start with that. It, beef uh, production is by far the, the most egregious driving factor in our environmental problems. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and, as, and don't despair to think that things aren't changing. They are. I've been in the plant-based promotion game since 1981, okay, 40 years ago. Look at what has happened since then. I, I get such encouragement by looking at what is now available, how each of our efforts has transformed the world. Uh, here's a, now, there's now a magazine, Vegan Food and Living. Whoever thought we'd see that, or 23 Buddha Bowl recipes. Costco now has organic produce. Uh, whoever thought we would see that, you can certainly eat a healthy vegan diet at home. And when you're out, if you don't have the Happy Cow app on your cell phone, please go to happycow.net, download it. And no matter where you are in the world, literally, if you're in Vienna or Vietnam, pull out your phone, fire up Happy Cow, and it will show you all the vegan restaurants, health food stores, vegan friendly 
uh, places to eat in your immediate area there. And, and this is such a powerful driving imperative and an understanding that is permeating into every aspect of our lives. And, and it's so reassuring to see uh, people understanding this truth and then acting on it. And it's permeating into our daily lives. Uh, uh, here is the owner of one of the most exclusive restaurants in New York, 11 Madison Park, Going Vegan. Never would have done that five or ten years ago. Here's McDonald's. You know, I've got a I've got a file on on my computer called things I never thought I'd see, and here's one right out of that file. McDonald's is putting a plant burger uh, on their recipe on their menu. Whoever thought we would see that? But that's such a powerful validation. When and if if McDonald's does it, you know that Wendy's and Burger King going to be right behind. And sure enough, here they are offering their impossible Whoppers and uh, their uh, black bean burgers, etc. Nearly 25% of people are now, they've, they've tried or are eating uh, these plant-based meats on a regular basis. Now, let me say, as a nutritionally oriented physician, that no one's saying that these burger products are the, the bastion of health. Yes, they are highly processed. Yes, they have uh, concentrated protein. They got salt in them. Yes, yes, that's true. But as a transition food, as a tool to help Joe meat eating American make that first step from a beef burger to a plant-based burger, if you can bite into one of these burgers and say, oh, wow, that was good. I could eat that. You, if you've opened his mind and heart just a tiny bit, then you have, then we've taken a step towards saving all of our futures. So I'm a big fan of these. There's a transition food. I eat one of these burgers every two months. We've got, we got some of the freezer. I think they've been there six months. They're a treat food. They're a novelty food. Those times when I miss eating a burger, we'll heat one up. And, and I'm satisfied for two or three months after that. So, you know, they're a treat food. Don't be eating them every day. But I think they have a great deal to offer us. And here we see uh, so many vegans around the world promoting this transition. Here's the herbivorous butcher. Whoever thought we would see that in Minnesota. Um, Vancouver is going to host an all vegan outdoor market this summer. Whoever thought we would see that. Here's NBA star, NBA star DeAndre Jordan. He's, he's going cold turkey vegan uh, and he's doing you know, just eggs there. Uh, it's starting to happen. You are not alone. Uh, here's the folks who good catch coming up with their, these plant-based fish alternatives for tuna and salmon. I'm so welcoming these because we've got to let the oceans heal. Again, C.C. Spear, so you'll see this. Uh, here the vegan pizzeria wins the top award at the World Pizza Championship. Whoever thought we would see that? And, and it's because we are, we are asking this. We are demanding these products. We are paying for them. That's the power we have in our purchasing power. Despair not. Just let's start jumping on the plant-based wagon and use our dollars to speak for us. And so hopeful that in China that consumes half the world's pork that produces hundreds and millions of hogs every year and cuts their throat and pollutes their lands. They're spending billions on American feed corn to shovel down the gullets of these pigs. They, the, the Chinese are, are getting so fed up with this that even they are looking uh, for pork substitutes, plant-based pork, and you bet the folks at Impossible and uh, Beyond Beef, they're stepping forward with their pork products as well. And China is, is promoting the, their own homegrown companies making plant-based pork. And that's going to change everything. Uh, from just the sheer weight of how many hogs they won't be slaughtering, but the example that they will set will ripple throughout the Asian world. Uh, and that will help the transition will happen. Kroger's now selling vegan eggs. <laughs> Whoever thought we would see that? So it's starting to happen. And, and the National Geographic Award gives its uh, National Geographic gives its awards to the most prestigious hotel. Guess what? The last year, a vegan hotel won. This is because we are demanding it and paying for it. Look what our purchase power can create. And there's getting calls in England. 
the Britons are told they must slash their meat meals by half, cut out dairy, plant up to 5,000 hectares of trees every year if they want to get to be carbon neutral. And they're serious about it. The government's thinking of introducing a meat tax as well they should because we're all paying the so-called externalities. The, the, the cattle producer doesn't have to pay to clean up the manure that they're dumping into the rivers. That's an externality. Well, uh, it's time that the producers and the consumers of these polluting products actually pay for them. And so I, I'm all in favor of a meat tax, which I won't have to pay because I don't eat meat. And we've got to reach the kids on so many levels, educate them, but feeding them in schools and hot vegan meals rolled out in, in Ireland. Uh, and it took a courageous politician to, to do this, but it took the parents demanding this, that I want vegan foods available for my uh, kid in school. Now, people say, well, what's that going to do to our economy? What's going to happen to all the farmers and the ranchers? You're going to throw them off their land. This is going to be economic people. No, actually, just the opposite is true. There's a wonderful organization called the Agricultural Fairness Alliance. I urge you to go to their website and join them. But no one wants to kick the farmers and ranchers off their land. They're, they're not the enemy. They're our brothers and sisters growing our food. Don't put them into conflict. Help these people. Transition. You don't have to run cattle on the land. You don't have to run a dairy operation. Grow food for people. So let's how about why don't we build one less aircraft carrier and use the billions of dollars that would go to that death machine to support our food growing neighbors as they transition to help these people send them to the local community college to learn how to grow new crops then buy their seeds for them buy their equipment for them give them crop insurance for 10 years send their kids to college with scholarships pay the mortgage on their house for 10 years help these people don't make them suffer. Don't grind them up in the economic gears of transition. Help them, lift them up, and put them into a new setting where they can grow high-fiber foods that make us healthier, not more diseased. So uh, not only do we need to use our purchasing power, we use to use our voting power. Vote out the politicians that keep forwarding, that keep uh, validating the same old farm bill that sends billions and billions of subsidies to the to the meat producers and the then the corn and soybean uh, growers that are growing animal fodder to shovel down the gullets of these hundreds of millions of cows and pigs and chickens. That land should be growing food for people. Help them. Um, uh, the AFA uh, has their own act called the Farms Act, and it will help uh, farmers and ranchers transition to do more sustainable food growing on their land. <clears throat> now, I, I am back to my beloved Wisconsin of my childhood. It's a dairy state. Um, and, you know, dairy is such a, an atrocious ec ecological uh, endeavor, and it's, a, it's an insult to, to women, to the female, the species. These poor animals uh, it's, uh, are, are assaulted, their female nature on every level. They are uh, forcibly impregnated. There's a word for that. I start with R. I won't use that. But cows don't naturally give milk. They, they just had a baby. So uh, they have to be impregnated. They carry their cow, their calf for nine months, just like a human mother does, give birth to a 65-pound baby. Uh, who And the farmer, my uncle, would come along and swipe that baby within a day at, or two at the most, take that calf away and start sucking that milk off for his own profits and selling it to the dairy. What happens to the calves? The boy calves um, spend four months in a veal pen before they have their throats cut as milk fed veal. And the female calves become four legged milk pumps like their mothers. <clears throat> and there's such an air of sadness hanging over in the dairy barn. And I didn't understand why when I was a kid, now I understand the, the, these are all new mothers who've just had their babies taken away from them. And these tears going down their eyes are real. It's, there's such sadness. And, and for the female animals to be forcibly impregnated, to have their babies taken away and then shot in the head after five years when their milk production goes down, it's an affront to women, to the female of the species. It's time for this barbaric practice to end. 
<clears throat> we don't have you know the, to the dairy farms. You have to run dairy operation on the land, and more and more dairy farmers are going broke, and they're transitioning to plant-based milks. So the AFA will help this happen. And more and more farmers are moving away from meat and dairy production. Here's a 67-year-old farmer. Uh, he's, he's in transition to growing industrial hemp. They're growing um, uh, hazelnuts uh, to turn into hazelnut milk. It's happening more and more. And, and it won't damage the economy. It'll save it. We're going to save trillions of dollars in healthcare costs, all the coronary artery bypass is not done. The, the cancer treatment's not given. We'll have millions, trillions of dollars that we can then put those solar panels on people's houses and uh, subsidize electric cars, fix the roads, provide scholarships to kids, put internet in everybody's house. Um, this is what the, the, the boon that will come to us, the, the windfall will come to us just for the simple expediency of moving from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet. Costs nothing to order the bean chili instead of the beef chili, but it will save all of our hopes, uh, all of our futures. Hope is what we become in action. So what actions are required? We've got to make meat eating as uncool as wearing fur or smoking cigarettes. You know, if a friend of yours pulled out a cigarette and lit up, what would you say? Are you still doing that at this day and age? Well, the same thing. People are ordering meat, well, you know, uh, they ought to get the message. Are you still eating that stuff, knowing what we know now? <clears throat> so you're not alone. Look around you. There are organizations can help you. Uh, if you haven't visited Extinction Rebellion, please do so. It will really open up your head to the urgency here and definitely see the conversation between Dr. Peter Carter and Roger Hallam. It's, it's shocking, scary, but absolutely required viewing for anyone who cares about our futures. So locally, be an example. The people watch what you eat. They watch what you buy. They watch what you order in the restaurant. Let your example teach them. But have potlucks at your house. Share your lunch. Feed people. <clears throat> Find out where your food comes from. Find out where your water comes from and who is protecting uh, the, your water supply. And then nationally, write your Congress people. You don't want them supporting the classic farm bill. Now, how do you know who your senator and congressman really are? Well, go to whosmyrepresentative.com, type in your zip code, and presto, there will be the names, numbers of your senator and representative. And write them a letter. What should I write? Dear Honorable So-and-So, our nation's excessive meat production consumption is destroying our health, our environment, and our futures. Meat is consumed in such large unhealthy quantities because government subsidies and policies make factory farm animal products unnaturally cheap. It distorts the economics of the free market, all these free market guys uh, su supporting current agriculture policies. Let the free market sort it out. Well, they are distorting the free market with their billion dollar subsidies to meat producing. I urge you not to support any legislation that provides subsidies or policies that promote industrial meat production and do all you can to, produce, to pass legislation to promote sustainable production of fruits and vegetables. Specifically, I urge you to support any given bills that are coming up. Go to PCRM.org and, and get on the mailing list. They will alert you when an important bill is coming up for consideration, whether to vote for or against it, depending on whether it promotes uh, animal or plant-based agriculture. Know internationally, there's vegans on every continent who know what you know, they're experiencing the same thing, they see what you see and they want what you want. Do something, connect with them. Everyone can start with your own diet, reduce your uh, uh, consumption of animal flesh and dairy products, which hopefully eliminate it altogether. <clears throat> and everyone has a gift, whether you can play guitar, give a talk, cook a meal. What's your gift? What can you contribute? We're in desperate straits. The polar ice caps are melting. The earth's getting warm. We need some magic. Where do we get magic? Well, young people in the internet are a source of powerful magic. We've seen magic before. When I grew up, the Berlin Wall 
was the most ominous demonstration of Soviet power is going to be there forever and threatening to, you know, to take over every free country on the planet. We thought this would never come down. Look at the, that formidable wall and all the guns behind it. But youth and commerce had something to say about that. In 1989, we watched that wall come down in a weekend. This is the power of our intention. <clears throat> we watched Nelson Mandela walk out of a prison after 23 years and become the president of his country. Magic has happened before. <clears throat> it's not too late. It's not too difficult. Changing our food choices is the one thing we can do now, and it costs nothing. Think of all the things that we used to have, we used to do in our lives that are now no longer even existing in our daily existence. Remember typewriters? Remember dial telephone? Most people, most young people, you don't even remember these things. Reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, these were standard appliances when I was growing up. Poof, they're gone. We used to do so many things we no longer do. We used to harpoon whales in the head. That, that was a heroic thing. We look at that now and say, my God, I can't believe we used to do that. We used to buy and sell black people. Oh my God, we, I can't believe we used to do that. So it shouldn't be too hard to leave our meat eating behind, to look at We used to, to slaughter hundreds of million, 20, 30 million cows. We do this to every year, old spent dairy cows. And we, to, in order to eat their flesh, good heavens. It shouldn't be that hard to leave this behind. <clears throat> We've made such great progress in restaurants, supermarkets, and the media, some more and more vegan celebrities, universities are giving courses in it. There's much more wide acceptance. So when the paleo folks say, we are everyone ought to be eating paleo. Are you kidding? You're talking about a flesh-based meal three times a day for 8 billion people. They deserve a better future than that. <clears throat> so when I'm in front of a medical school class, imploring these young doctors to open their minds and hearts to the healing properties of a plant-based diet, I know what I'm also really saying. And I know the goal that I'm really trying to accomplish. We can get the doctors recommending plant-based diet to their patients. Everything will change. My noble profession is the greatest bottleneck going in preventing this evolution to a plant-based diet, and I'm trying to free up that bottleneck. So I'm on the soapbox saying it'll lower high blood pressure, it'll unclog your arteries, it'll retard autoimmune disease, or doing all these wonderful physical changes in the human body. But I'm really trying to save the earth and all our futures and the animals on this planet uh, by humans transitioning to a plant-based diet. And my profession has a great role to play in that. So as Samuel Jackson tells us, what's on your plate? Just all of our futures, that's all. So do what you can do. As Theodore Roosevelt said, do what you can where you are with what you have. That's the message, that's the plea. If you want to contact me and help me in my efforts to educate the doctors, go to my website, drclab.com, click on Moving Medicine Forward, and you can see how you can help us. But the best thing you can do that is order a plant-based meal for lunch today and for every meal after that. So that's my message. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing, and I will be glad to uh, uh, entertain uh, any questions. Uh, that may have arisen from my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Copper, for that. Um, I know you gave information about uh, where they can, people can find you, um, but where can people find your books? Um, I, they can't because I don't have any in print. Uh, I am in the process of writing my first book. Uh, or my, well, I wrote Vegan Nutrition long ago. Yes, they're Vegan Nutrition. Uh, and that's unfortunately out of print. I think you can get it on the internet for $1,000. Don't do that. There's so many better books on vegan nutrition now. Uh, but there's an excellent one called Nourish, N-O-U-R-I-S-H, by uh, Brendan Davis and Dr. Uh, Resma Shah. Um, get their book if you want to learn about uh, 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 plant-based eating. <clears throat> right. Yep, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, so now, as you said, we're, we'll start the Q&A session. I'm just want to explain to everyone how we do this here. Um, we normally don't take questions directly from the chat. 
Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise their hands. If you're not sure how to do this, what you need to do is click on the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom window, um, then click on the raised hand function in that menu that pops up. Um, we will then take questions in the order in which we receive them. And once your turn, we'll unmute you and prompt you to ask your question for Dr. Clapper. And with that, Dr. Clapper, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's go. All right, so first we have Kaylee. Kaylee, what is your question? Hi, Dr. Clapper, you are so amazing. And I thank you so much for everything that you've done. Um, I wanted to give us an example. Um, you, you, at True North, you spoke to my sister, Lisa, who is a journalist in, in Europe. And as a result, she came into the play, uh, to True North on a wheelchair and she left without it. Um, and when she went back after a month or two of eating regularly, even the Mediterranean diet, unfortunately, she's back in the wheelchair, but she knows what she can do. She knows what she's capable of. And um, I want to, I, I will contact you on your website for, uh, to learn how to get copies of this entire presentation, because I'd like to bring it to many schools and see uh, who would be willing to, to, to show it. Um, thank you so much. You've, you've changed so many lives and you're such a beautiful soul. Thank you. Oh, thank you for those <laughs> for the lovely sentiment. Thank you so much. And uh, I believe, uh, as the organizers will tell you, this particular talk should be freely available to uh, uh, to rebroadcast wherever you like. So, by all means, get the word out. So, thank and, you. And and was, give my best to your sister, by the way. I, uh, I will. Can I tell you that my grandchildren, who were born, the one of them was born while we were at True North. They're now six and seven years old, and they are completely vegan. They've never had any flesh, any animal food, and they are strong and healthy. So please, all the people who have children, know that that's possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you are welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you for that. And uh, I hope everybody heard. Uh, you can raise children on a vegan diet. They yes. grow up big and strong. And, and they're happy. Them. And they're happy kids. And, and they uh, care about all, all plants, all life, all life. And, and they care about them, all of, of life. How beautiful. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Thank bet. you. Yeah, thanks, Kaylee, for that uh, lovely comment. Next, we have Dominique. Dominique, what's your question? Hi, Dr. Clapper. I really like you. I really like the way you talk without... Um, like you're really a straight talker and I really enjoy that. And uh, like we've seen in many other presentations as, as well as, as uh, Dr. Rao's presentation, the, the year zero is coming very quickly. And so <clears throat> I know that some people say, well, you have to be really nice to people and to accept people how they are and everything. But it's like the year zero is coming quick and we are in a, I mean, dire straits, really. And so I'm really happy that you are going to these medical students um, with your lectures. And I was wondering, what are the most common questions asked that by the medical students during your lectures? Like, are, are they more like health wise or do they actually care about the earth and uh, what's happening there? Oh, thank you. Uh, important question. <clears throat> the most common questions I get from the medical students are, where are you going to get my protein? No. Uh, you're going to get that one. And uh, if I'm not drinking milk, where do I get the calcium? So they're on that level. Their awareness of the, of the planet uh, is, is not very great, but you bet I've got environmental slides in every one of my medical school presentation because I say, you know, this dwarfs all the issues about cholesterol, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then they have other questions. Well, how do I get my patients to do this? So, you know, I've got um, Joe meat and potato guy. How do I, you know, open the door in his mind there? Uh, and uh, there's a whole art to that. You, there are plant-based dietitians and health coaches that can help with that. But basically put the food in their mouth, make a dynamite tofu lasagna or pasta primavera. And they say, oh, I could eat that. And, you know, then, you, then you've moved them an important inch down that road. So uh, the students, you know, they're, they're aware of the health issues there. They're, they're embryonic in their understanding of the planet. 
but uh, I, in every one of my lectures, I show them pictures of the earth and, and what their, what the current diet is actually doing. And, and many of them, they're young parents themselves. They're, you know, they're in their twenties and thirties and they've got little kids. And uh, I think it really makes an impression on them. So I bring that environmental message to the medical students as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And you are one of the reasons that I became vegan for four years ago. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dominique. Next, we have Sherry. Sherry, what is your question? Good morning, and thank you for your very inspiring presentation. So many organizations that I didn't even know about. I had a hard time keeping up. I'm excited to visit their sites. My question is about the actual term vegan. I've noticed since my husband and I transitioned and, you know, you get very excited about encouraging your friends and neighbors and families. Vegan has become this really ugly politicized word. And I am thinking the longer I'm in this, we need a different term to be more inclusive. Like you were talking about, you know, the people who depend on agriculture to feed their families. I just feel like it's very divisive. And I wonder, is there anything going on in your circles to try to come up with some more inclusive terminology and vocabulary so that it's, it's more inclusive, it's not political and divided? Thank you. Oh, thank you. And you put your finger on such an important point. And you're absolutely right. Uh, when I became vegan in 1981, and I liked that word as soon as I heard it and all that it implied, yay. But then I saw as time went on, it's the, the uh, many people viewed it either as threatening or those who are going and eating meat, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it's become, you know, you know very well, it's become the holier than thou vegan, uh, judging people and all of that. And there's a huge amount of baggage now attached to that word. And I seldom use the V word at, at, at this point. I used it in this in this uh audience because yeah i think we're, we're all in, uh, on a similar level of understanding but you're absolutely right and and plus the fact and it's a valid criticism that just because a person's eating vegan doesn't mean they're eating healthy and you can live on vegan oreos and energy drinks and it's a vegan diet but you're not going to be healthy doing that there's a lot of vegan junk food out there <clears throat> so um so uh, just like you, I too am scrambling for that word that encapsulates all this without the, all the baggage of the vegan term. And so we're, st we're stuck with these uh, inelegant multi-word label, whole food plant-based. Uh, when that's true, it's whole food, it's not processed junk there, and it's all plant-based, it grew out of the ground, that's a valid description, but it's not very exciting, it's not a very efficient term. Uh, and um, uh, someone you know, mentioned you know, living food, and that's great, I mean, no animal product is living, that's for sure, but uh, you know, bread isn't living, and it's, it's an acceptable plant-based product. So, um, so I wish I could say, oh, the word, the term we're now using is, you know, I wish I had that term, but uh, I don't either. So I'm, I'm still stuck in whole food plant-based land here. Uh, and so if anyone, especially in this vast audience, if you guys have the, the term that would, would do the, would be the magic amulet to turn the lock in people's heads to, so they understood it without all the judgmental baggage that goes with the term vegan, I'm open to that. So please send your ideas along there. But till then, now, a plant strong. So Andrew, Andrew mentioned, that's a good one. And Rip Esselstyn and the crew. Uh, came up with a plant forward diet, a plant strong diet. I like that one. Um, thank you. Uh, for eating from the garden. That's a sweet phrase as well. Uh, someone just mentioned, thank you for that. Now, plant exclusive, Cheryl says, uh, plant is lovely. I love plant strong. Um, whole food plant based is the alternate here. So I'm good. these are all great ones. Plant strong, I like that. Plant forward, I, I like that one. And, and that's more acceptable to the doctors as well. Nutrivive, oh, that's a good one. Um, but it's more to my colleagues, if they hear plant strong, plant forward, they're easier than that, than vegan. Um, so yes, let's go for plant, plant strong, plant forward. Yay, plant predominant. No, that's, that's a good one. Because you don't think you're going to be 100% vegan, you should. But if someone wants to hold on a little bit, it's a plant predominant diet. I'll take that right now. If they get their meat eating down to once a week, I'll take that right now. 
So thank you for all those ideas. Plants only. Good. All these wonderful suggestions come out. A plants only diet. Fair enough. Thanks, Chair, for that. Um, next, we have Aaron. Aaron, what is your question? Hi, doctor. Thank you very much for your presentation. I switched to a full plant-based diet about three years ago, thanks to all these lectures and conferences. And I want to ask you, if a vegan want to elevate the health advantages, what portion or between raw and cooked plant-based diet would, would you recommend? Because there are some people that say that it's not enough to be vegan, you need to switch to that most of this should be raw. I was wondering what, what is your thought about this? And, and if you can also uh, let us know your opinion about low sugar, dark chocolate and heated and roasted nuts and seeds, what, what are your thoughts about this as well? Thank you. Okay, I missed the last part of that. As far as um, how raw food versus cooked food, the, the percentage, I'm a big raw food fan. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think at least a third half of your diet minimum should be uncooked raw foods. Uh, to be a complete raw food, it can be done, but you wind up eating all day, I find, because uh, the, the calorie density is so low. Uh, and you, you know, you can't really eat, you can lose a lot of the starches as far as uh, uh, you can't eat raw rice and raw, raw wheat, etc. I guess you can soak them. Um, but to make a long story short, uh, I think cooked foods are efficient to, to the baked potato is a good way to get calories in. That said, um, an all cooked food diet, I think, is lacking in vitality. So a rough uh, um, uh, measurement would be at least 50-50. And what does that turn into <clears throat> where my eating style has evolved? I usually don't eat till noon. And after that, um, and I would urge everybody, and I tell my patients, hey, at least have one big colorful salad every day. I have a big honker salad. Uh, and that's how I start my afternoon eating day. And I will frequently, you know, we have a big salad in the fridge. And I'll put a big bowl of it and then open up a can of beans or chickpeas and dump that on the salad as well. And it's a meal. And that gets me through till dinner. And we have a nice uh, plant-based uh, dinner and I'm done with eating for the day. So have at least one big salad day. And it turns out with those two meals, that is 50% of my diet is, is uncooked. So do that. But for snacks, uh, uh, use uh, celery stalks and carrot sticks to shovel in your hummus there. There's ways to get raw foods. And of course, fruits are raw. And so uh, shoot for a 50% uh, uh, proportion. I think that's it would be a, a good goal to start with at least. And I didn't get the last part of the question. Yes, so so the, the last part was if about nuts and seeds. So Nuts and do, seeds. Yeah, do, do you yes. think we should uh, soak them in water before eating them? And what do you think about heat and, and roasted, the nuts and seeds? Uh, I'm a big fan of nuts and seeds. They have oils and lignans that we need. And if you're not going to be using liquid oils, which we shouldn't, um, then get it out of avocados and walnuts and flax seeds, etc. So, so we... Um, uh, so uh, we've got a big jar of ground flax, hemp, and chia seeds in the fridge. I'll throw a couple of tablespoons of that onto my salad. Or if those mornings I have a cereal, I'll throw them into my cereal as well. Um, but easy does it on the nuts and seeds. Hold them, to, the nuts especially, to a, to a handful a day. That's it. And eat them consciously. Don't just shovel them in there. Uh, one walnut at a time. You know, put it in your mouth. Make walnut butter in your mouth before you swallow it. Be conscious when you're eating, especially these concentrated foods, the nuts and the seeds. So I think they have a legitimate role in the diet. Uh, I throw a handful of sunflower seeds onto my salad there. So yes, I'm a big nut and seed fan, but don't be sitting in front of a TV with a five pound bag of cash and shoveling them in. That's not what I'm in favor of. The whole, as long as you hold it to a small handful a day and the walnuts are best because of their omega threes. Uh, I think the nuts and seeds have a legitimate place in the diet. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Aaron. Next we have Andrew. Andrew, what is your question? Andrew, are you there? Andrea, talk to us, Andrea. Somebody Can you want... hear me? Yeah, yeah, we hear now, you. yeah right. now we hear you. Okay. Um, I went on a, I did this on my own, but I shouldn't have. Um, 
I remember I was stage 2A cervical cancer. I mean, um, diabetes, high blood pressure, pancreatitis, a um, lot of things. I just reversed all of them on my own. My only problem is for the last two months, I've had irregular spotting. Um, and I don't know if it has anything to do with the diet. I'm sorry, what, what is the problem for the last two months? What, what is the problem? I Irregular it. vaginal spotting, like light bleeding. Light vaginal, light vaginal bleeding. Um, how, if, can I ask how old you are? Yeah, 51. 51. Um, then you absolutely, I know you probably don't like to tangle with the medical establishment, but God forbid you've got an endometrial cancer or something up there. You really need at least get a diagnosis, at least see a gynecologist, let her determine where that bleeding is coming from. And uh, assuming it's benign, you know, there's various things you can do. You may have a little polyp up there that just needs to be cauterized or something, but you don't want to overlook a cancer if it's there. So please get that diagnosed and treated properly, but good for you. What a great transformation you've done with all those other uh, 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 medical issues you had, but uh, do get a proper diagnosis on that bleeding. That's a bit worrisome in a 51 year old person. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, good luck. Thank you for that doctor. And next we have Shanti. Shanti, what is your question? Hi, Dr. Clapper. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It was awesome and just so comprehensive, and I can't wait to be able to share this. Um, I spoke last night at your other talk, and I've been born and raised vegan or whole food plant-based. We didn't even use the word vegan because we didn't really know it when I was born 45 years ago, um, but I've enjoyed excellent health my whole entire life, uh, as well as my siblings and my whole family, and uh, now my nieces and nephews. So. Um, I just wanted to say what I really loved in your presentation was how positive you are about illustrating how much has changed over this amount of time, like in 30 years, because when I was a kid, there was almost nothing as far as health food stores or options. And it's come so far that one of the things I keep trying to focus on in outreach is there are a lot of people with a negative tone, like everybody I know, or the majority of people feel uh, like it's too much. So I think for anybody who's following this, it's really important, like as a nutrient to be very positive, which I like that plant positive term to keep moving, keep the momentum and moving forward. Because if you have a longer term view of how much has changed over the years, it, it really has come so incredibly far. I think Dr. Rao's uh, exponential calculation that we can make it to a vegan world by 2026 is accurate. So I'm just so appreciative of your work and I'm so excited to share this presentation because it's one of the best I've seen. And so my, last, my question would actually be in obviously your work, when you encounter like negativity around, oh, well, nobody will make those changes or people uh, are so set in their ways, like, do you have like a personal way that you kind of change the dialogue to be more positive? And I'm asking because of, of course, your uh, elder wisdom on having done this for so long. So thank you for any thoughts on that. Thank you, Shani. Um, Homo sapiens, we're quite a species, aren't we there? Yeah. You know, the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the word sapien, you know, homo sapiens, sapien means wise. It's, yes. Someone who's sapient is wise. Oh, yeah. Well, boy, that certainly doesn't seem to apply to our species. So how do we get people to change? You know, that is the $64 trillion question. Yes. Um, so um, I find that... Um, and you're probably well aware of this, people are even considered the issue uh, by coming in through one of three doors. They either have health concerns, obesity, high blood pressure, whatever. They suddenly become aware of the plight of the animals that they're paying yes. for having these wonderful animals having their throats cut. Or they understand that global warming is important and they got kids and grandkids. Uh, and so I listen to where their, their heart is, where their interest is. Yes. And I, you got to meet them where they're at. Yes. And um, if they uh, 
you know, and and it, you got to be a bit of an artist here, and you can't be credit. <laughs> don't show them the slaughterhouse pictures right away there. Right, uh, right. But uh, but be sensitive. Understand that you know they're coming from. You know, we all grew up with our the, with our favorite foods and our comfort foods, and and it means daddy was wrong in serving me that steak, and they don't want. You got to respect right. that. You know, don't cross a bunch of wires. Uh, but, but um, you know, try and accentuate the positive, like the old song says. And, yes. uh, oh, boy, yeah, I just had a, a lasagna last night that was to, to, to live for, you know, not to die for. <laughs> uh, and uh, really, what was in it? You know, and, then, you know, talk, we'll go in through the food door that way. And better yet, put the food in their mouth. Uh, oh, I could eat that. <laughs> Ooh, that you know, that you got to yes. you know, that first inch is important, you know, yes. or you know, one comment about the planet, you know, that uh, you know that def you know letting the forest come back would would keep the ice caps from melting. Oh, really? So find out where they're at and have have the facts to uh, to support uh, their their moving down that continuum a little bit. And once they open up to one aspect, of course, it all cascades in. Yes. So um, so find their their place of uh, of interest and vulnerability and respectfully uh, coax them through that door to uh, to adopt the, the bigger picture there. Thank you. That's wonderful. I have gotten a lot of people to transition and I'm always looking for new tips and help and resources because it always feels like it's not going fast enough, but yet so many people are working on it. I really feel so, so much hope. So yes. thank you so much for this wonderful talk and blessings to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Respect Dr. is the key. Sherry says respect is the key. You bet it yeah. is. <laughs> All right, next we have Wendy. Wendy, what is your question? Hello, doctor. I'm calling in from Boca Raton. Hi, hey, Emma. Hi. I miss the conferences. I always went to them. And uh, I'm a Hippocrates health educator. So not to throw any bummer kind of thing in, but um, could you address the fact that Bill Gates has bought up much of the farmland in this country and he's a fan of GMOs. And then we also have the problem with fertilizer not being available for the farmers and the farmers, everything that it costs them to run their farm has quadrupled in price, which is making it harder for the farmers to grow produce. Um, I grow sprouts at home. I don't have a place to grow my own vegetables. So let's say six months from now, they're saying that they're potentially could be a produce shortage. And uh, so that's what I would like you to please address. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Wendy. Oh my, uh, we got trouble right here in River City, uh, no doubt. And what Wendy just said is uh, makes you despair. And, uh, and these huge economic forces and, environment, uh, uh, and the financial powers that be are not uh, aware, uh, it's so disheartening to uh, to go to these environmental conferences and not a word is mentioned about diet. And same thing, I don't know what, Bill Gates, I think, is aware of this, but uh, money is a very powerful uh, distorter of reality, what to do. Um, well, as the old Chinese proverb goes, you know, the opportunity, uh, uh, crisis and opportunity are the same word there. And, uh, and so this, this crisis is going to come, uh, and though there might be big produce shortages, and people are going to be complaining, and they're going to be going into the talk shows, and they're going to be really distressed. They're going to be complaining to the produce manager at the Safeway. Um, well, that's a great opportunity to, to use that energy to say, listen, th this farmland could be growing food for people. And, and uh, really go to the AFA, the Agricultural Fairness Line. They've got programs to help this transition happen. And, and there are some Congress people um, who are open to this, Cory Booker, and there's a, a couple of vegan congressmen there. Um, so uh, we are hitting the, the, the dregs of this. And, the, and that's a really scary prospect that you've outlined there. Uh, we need to use that energy, call into the talk shows, call your congressman, write them the letters, 
uh, join the AFA and, and we got to take, you know, it's like turning an ocean liner, but we got to take our food production system and lurch it over to, to uh, sustainable plant production. And, and the, I'm not an agricultural economist, but I'm sure the economics, uh, again, because you can grow so much more food on that land than just grinding out corn and soybeans, um, that that very shortage of the produce is going to potentially drive energy towards growing more produce. And so uh, it, it's going, we were in for some rocky times that we've created, on our, you know, we brought it on ourselves. But here's the time not to despair. Um, use your use your platform to point out over there, support the, the produce farmers, and uh, and hopefully you know they they go, they suddenly they locate an extra half billion in the budget there. So um, so do what you can to be the voice for the for the land and for the animals and for the uh, and for the healthy foods and ask and we shall receive. We've got to assume that. Okay, and lastly, so organizations that we could uh, get involved in would be the AFA and probably the PCRM has to do with legislation. What else? Yes, and the climate healers. Go to those three and uh, you'll, you'll find plenty of resources in all three. And go to Extinction Rebellion and uh, they've got political tools there. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Grow sprouts at home. And grow sprouts at home. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you so okay. much. Thanks, Randy. Take care. Thanks, uh, Dr. Clapper. Next, we have David. David, what's your question? Yes. Um, I had two quick questions. One, when concerning chia seeds, is it necessary to soak them or can I just grind them? And the other is, when concerns washing produce, can I just wash them water for five minutes and then do another five minutes? Or do you think it's important to add a tiny bit of baking soda? when washing produce? Yeah, those two good questions. I never grind my chia seeds. I just throw them on. They're just in the jar there. Uh, and if someone is a chia seed expert and should tell me why I should be soaking or grinding them, please let me know. But I'm a, uh, but I just, yeah, I just, uh, they're, they're, they're so tiny. I just eat those chia seeds. Um, and the whole washing produce thing, you know, can you can you wash pesticides off? I, th I think Dr. Gregor's latest is, there really isn't much you can do to get the pesticides off. You should wash them anyway. Uh, there are bacteria uh, on the surface there. And uh, uh, and would a little baking soda help? Probably would make it more alkaline water. And yeah, I wouldn't have any problem with that. So wash the produce, but it's, it's getting the microparticles of dirt, microplastics, and bacteria off there, not the pesticides. You want to buy the organic produce, pay those farmers handsomely for not using the pesticides pesticides, et cetera, but then wash that organic produce under, under running water or dip them into a bowl of water that you put in a, a little pinch of uh, bicarbonate or baking soda. I think that's a good idea. So wash your produce, but and buy you organic think, ones. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's important to soak nuts and seeds before you eat them and use a dehydrator? Um, I'm a big fan of soaking nuts and seeds. It activates the enzymes that, um, that kind of pre-digest them. Uh, and, um, and, and I love the taste and texture of almonds that have been soaked. They're sweet, crunchy. I really like them. And as I said, it activates the enzymes that start pre-digesting the sugars and starches in there. So, um, so I'm a big fan of, of, and I like soaking sunflower seeds. Uh, most dried fruits we soak overnight, figs and apricots, we soak them. So I'm a big fan of, of soaking these uh, at least for a couple hours, if not overnight. So, and, then uh, you, mm -hmm. and then use a dehydrator or no? Uh, I like the hydrators are they're fun. Um, and I like sun dried tomatoes out of the out of the dehydrator there. And uh, uh, and I'm a big fan of dried apple slices and banana slices. I love you know dried fruits. Um, so yay, uh, enjoyed them. Uh, don't eat too many of them, but enjoy them. Yes, they're, they're a good thing to have. All right. Soak at least two hours, though, for most things. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, David, for that. Um, next, we have Sylvester. Sylvester, what is your question? Sylvester? Um, thank you, doctor, um, uh, for, uh, for having me. I'm uh, in 2016. Um, I was really sick. I always was uh, using the standard American diet, as you described. And thank you, you almost saved my life. I was really, really sick. 
I could say that I was just standing by, by, my, um, by my grave. Uh, now I'm much better, uh, doctor. And then uh, the only symptoms I have is just like a whistling noise in my head. What do you think uh, that causes? Oh, boy. Um, you're probably talking about a condition called tinnitus, um, uh, ringing in the ears, etc. And by the way, the word is pronounced tinnitus, not tinnitus, everybody. Okay. Tinnitus means ringing like a bell. Um, and, uh, and I wish I could tell you that uh, eat two cloves of garlic and wear a rutabaga around your neck and the tinnitus will go away. Um, I can't tell you that because if I did, uh, if, I, if I could have a cure like that, I would use it myself. I have constant tinnitus in my own ears. I feel like I'm always in seat A14 and, uh, and a 747. I've got a constant jet engine noise in my, in my head. And I've not found anything to, to reduce it, unfortunately. Um, I don't notice it when I'm out outside and I notice it mostly in quiet rooms. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, make sure that your diet is balanced. It's not a mineral deficiency. Make sure uh, that your blood vessels going up to your ears are nice and wide open. They'll stay on that healthy plant-based diet. But as far as actually turning off the, the tinnitus, um, I'm still looking for that magic wand myself. If you find one, go to my website and let me know what it is. I'd, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Clapper. Uh, you saved my life and thank uh, you for your wonderful work. Well, I'm thank happy you. Easter if I, if I want to see you tomorrow. Well, thank you. No extra charge for saving your life. Thank you very much. <laughs> God bless you, Dr. Clapper. Uh, thank you. All right. Thanks, Sylvester, for that. Um, I just want to remind everyone, and it was coming uh, right now, um, you know, we have a few hands left. Um, we have over 200 people in this room. Come on. If you guys want to ask Dr. Clapper a question, now's the time to do so. Okay. There. Yep. Now I see more hands coming up. Let's go. All right. So let's have uh, Sophia. Sophia, what is your question? Hi, doctor. Thank you so much for your generous guidance. Um, my question, please, is are there any natural remedies to alleviate bloating as I enjoy eating broccoli sprouts? Uh, you, you have bloating when you eat broccoli yeah. sprouts. Is yeah. that, yeah. is that yeah. the issue? Yeah. Um, well, most bloating is from swallowed air. That sounds strange, but... Um, uh, uh, every time we swallow, two tablespoons of air goes down in our stomach, uh, but some food has lots of air in it and a forkful of sprouts. There's air between the sprouts there. And, uh, and we were eating and talking, shovel it down and, and the air goes down there. And once the air is in our stomach, it's going to go one of two places. It's going to come up in a belch or it's going to go down and through your guts and you're going to feel bloated from there. Most bloating is swallowed air. So um, one thing to do is uh, to put the sprouts in your mouth put the fork down and make sprout puree in your mouth before you swallow it. Just chew those sprouts to a cream because uh, it'll force most of the air out of the food and you'll swallow less air. So, and, and whatever you're eating the food with, if you're eating the sprouts with a salad or whatever, again, chew, make salad puree in your mouth before you swallow it. It's mostly swallowed air from not chewing well enough and, and eating too fast. If you do that, if you chew the broccoli sprouts to a cream, they really shouldn't cause bloating. Uh, and if they do, um, as your intestinal bacteria change, that bloating should go away. So broccoli sprouts are just so good on so many levels. Uh, uh, eat, start back down to just small amounts, just one forkful. Start with that, chew it to a cream, see if you can uh, get away without any bloating and then slowly increase the amount. But slow down, chew your food better, but keep eating those broccoli sprouts. They're doing good things for you. Please, what about juicing, green juicing too? Um, juicing is okay. Uh, you lose some of the fiber when you do that. And a lot of the good nutrients are attached to the fiber. I'm more of a fan of green smoothies than green juicing, uh, but it sure beats uh, Coca-Cola. So I'm, so if you want to drink these juices, go ahead. Don't chug lug them down all at once. Uh, you know, take a, take an hour to drink a juice, take a mouthful, put the glass down, chew it up, mix your saliva, <laughs> swallow it. Wait five or 10 minutes before you take the next swallow. There's nothing physiologic about dumping 12 ounces of potassium and fructose into your system all at once. So, so enjoy the juices slowly, but eat the veggies. You get more nutrients out thank of them. You. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Aaron. Aaron, I'm gonna unmute you. Please ask your question. 
Hi, it's a follow-up question to the to the uh, panel was yesterday about omega-3. So if a vegan have a serious omega-3 deficiency, even if he's eating, you know, uh, ground flaxseed and, and walnuts and some other, what would be your recommendation in such a situation? Thank you. Uh, the whole uh, omega-3 thing is still controversial. Behind his question, I think, is whether you need to take preformed DHA or not. And these blood tests, which I'm becoming really disenchanted with, <clears throat> because these omega check blood tests, they tell you what's happening in your red blood cells. But that's not the issue. The issue is what's happening in your brain tissue. <clears throat> and the red cells don't necessarily reflect that. So, um, so I think he's got the right idea. A handful of walnuts and a couple of tablespoons of ground flax and hemp and chia it should keep your brain tissue full of omega-3s. And hopefully that's all you need. Now, I know Dr. Furman, Dr. Khan, they go nuts when I say this. And they, uh, they really, everybody needs to be consuming omega-3 oils. But I'm not so sure of that. And I'm not so sure when you take these preformed oils, whether you're not backing up the progression of uh, linolenic acid down to DHA. Now, there's evidence showing that when you take preformed EPA and DHA, that you may be backing up the, uh, uh, the precursors to that, and the body uses those precursors. And so what are we doing? Is it a clumsy, crude thing to be coming in with these preformed DHA capsules? It may well be. It might be a good thing, but I'm, I'm doubtful of it right now. So, um, so absolutely, keep eating those walnuts and hemp seeds and flax seeds. And, um, and I'm going to be corresponding with Dr. Furman and expressing my concerns. I'll let you know what our dialogue has to say. But right now, abs don't neglect the flax, chia, and hemp seeds. Uh, and uh, and uh, keep, keep your tissues well stocked with those. And uh, that's you know, the most important thing you can do. Uh, and dark green leafy vegetables as well have omega-3s. And stay tuned. We'll uh, see about the... Uh, and we'll see about whether you need these preformed algae oils. I think there's a good chance that we don't need them and they might be doing some harm uh, to be determined. So that's the best I can tell you. Thank you so much, doctor. And, and another quick question. What are your thoughts about dark chocolate, low sugar dark chocolate? Do you think they are healthy? healthy? Dark chocolate, chocolate. Soflate? Uh, no, dark, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. Oh, yeah. yay. We like dark chocolate. Um, we have a bar in our refrigerator. It's been there for two months. We, you know, we have one square in the evening, maybe two squares. We're slowly working our way through this bar, but the, but we all read uh, there's antioxidants and uh, you know good things in, in dark chocolate. Don't eat. That doesn't mean eat a big you know 16 ounce bar of chocolate. Oh, doctor says it's good for me. But you know one or two squares in the evening a couple times a week I think are just fine. Let's, well, it's one of the few joys in life we have left to us here. So by all means, enjoy a little bit of dark chocolate from time to time. Thank you so much again. You bet. Uh, next up is Randy. Randy, I'm going to unmute you. If you could please ask your question. Dr. Clapper. Yes. Um, I have blood work coming up. Um, maybe, and it's through the telehealth. So with one of the doctors in your group, um, but yet hearing the doctor maybe earlier today, it almost sounds like maybe I should add some more tests, uh, blood work. Um, I don't know what's your thoughts on maybe two or three that aren't as common to be checked that should be checked. Well, I'm not sure which presentation you heard as far as which tests were recommended there. But in general, um, uh, you know, you need a blood count and, and a metabolic profile and a lipid panel, you know, the usual stuff. But to that, I've always been ordering lately now a, um, a vitamin D, um, a vitamin B12, homocysteine. Um, those are all needed to, um, uh, to keep your, bloods, uh, um, uh, your blood vessels uh, healthy. Um, and I'll put in a high sensitivity CRP and HSCRP as a, an index of how much inflammation is going on in the body. Uh, and, um, that's usually where I, um, uh, that's usually where I, I, I hold it there. Let me just, uh, I'll write this one thing. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. But, um, 
the HSCRP uh, gives me insight into inflammation. If the person has clogged arteries, or there's a question, or they've got a high cholesterol, I've got lots of vegans with high cholesterols. I, um, I want to know, do the, is that inflammatory fire burning in the walls of their arteries? So I, there's an inflammatory panel uh, that your doctor can order high sensitivity CRP, oxidized cholesterol, um, uh, uh, myeloperoxidase, phospholipase. They're, they're in the inflammatory panel that Quest Labs and LabCorp does. So, um, so I will add those inflammatory markers on if I've got a vegan with high cholesterol. But other than that, just add an HSCRP, a vitamin D, a B12, and a homocysteine uh, to your standard battery test. And I think you get a pretty good idea what's happening in your body there. I think one mentioned earlier was the 9P21. Detects arthrosclerosis, maybe? No, um, I don't think you need that. Okay. Um, okay. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, okay, the next one up is Wendy. Wednesday, I'm, I'm, I'm going to unmute you if you could please ask your question. Hi. Hi. Hi, Dr. Clapper. I'm Wendy. And I had two questions. One was maybe you already answered it, but I'm about 80% whole food plant based. So I want to know what, what, do you, what frequency do you recommend for getting my blood tests? Like, you know, measure cholesterol, A1C, B12, and some of the other ones you mentioned. And the second question was um, for making sure I get enough calcium and B12. As an example, is it better to take these through supplements, food, or I'll call it enriched foods? So for example, nutritional yeast has B12 added to it. Um, you know, a lot of these vegan milks, they have uh, plant milks, they have calcium. I was just wondering what is the best way, you know, to make sure I'm getting enough good, of those? Yeah, good questions. Um, of course, food is always the best source, of course. But uh, knowing what we know that, you know, you need a fair amount of calcium, you know, up to 500 milligrams of calcium a day from your diet would be really nice. Uh, and it can be hard to get that just from food. So I'm a big fan of the calcium fortified plant milks and the B12 fortified nutritional yeast. I'm fine with those. And uh, your, uh, and so shoot for about 500 milligrams of calcium in your, in your food and, you know, using the supplemented if necessary. Uh, and uh and if, you, if you're not a nutritional yeast fan, then yeah, you do need to take a, a B12 supplement three times a week under your tongue there or, uh, in, in some form. But uh, if you can get it out of food, that's always the best. And uh, second place under that is the fortified foods. And coming in third are just as plain straight supplements. I'm not a big fan of calcium tablets and things like that. And uh, the, the questions you asked earlier about the test, I think we mentioned that. Thank you for mentioning the A1C and you need that as well. But get, get your, uh, uh, your B12 homocysteine uh, uh, and uh, inflammatory markers, HSCRP measured, and you'll, you'll have pretty much all you need to know. I'm sorry, so uh, how, how often do you recommend that? Because B, uh, what, the blood test or the B12? The, but, uh, the, blood, the blood tests. Oh, once a year, you shouldn't need, unless you've got an ongoing medical problem, once a year should be plenty. <clears throat> okay. By the way, just a, um, a by the way, I was just curious if you have any comments on resveratrol. On resveratrol, yeah, eat grapes. Um, I think they're, they're wonderful. And, uh, and the prunes and plums, and, you know, the, the dark fruits have resveratrol. Eat them, enjoy them. But again, there's no magic... Uh, I'm not a bit, oh, if I just take this resveratrol, then I'll be, uh, I'll be what? I can keep eating my meat. I hope not. Uh, and uh, I'll be, I'll be healthy. No, you're going to be healthy from the whole plant-based food stream coming in with all, with all these whole foods, with every meal, meal after meal. That's where health comes from. It's not from a resveratrol capsule or, or a supplement. Um, get resveratrol. I'm all for it, but get it out of grapes and prunes and plums. Uh, but uh, they're, they're not the answer. Uh, they're just part of uh, a good balanced diet. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. all the information. You bet.
Uh, next up is DS. Um, please ask your question. Oh, hi, yeah, Dan, uh, Dr. Clapper. I love your, uh, I really appreciate your work and thank you for the presentation. Um, I have been whole food plant-based for almost five years, feel fantastic running marathons. Even at 50, I got my ocean lifeguarding certification just for, for kicks, you know, so I'm, I'm thriving. I love thank it. You. Everything's thank you. Everything's great. Um, and, uh, I, my blood work, you know, you know, my weight is good. My blood work is, is pretty stellar. All my in inflammation markers are low. My blood pressure is 110 over 70, maybe sometimes lower. So everything is great, but I have this, um, this cholesterol is a little high. I got it taken uh, two years ago. It was 197 and then 108 for the bad, for the LDL. And then last year, I've been slacking a little bit, eating a little too much store-bought hummus, and it went up to like 230 and 120 for the LDL. So uh, I'm not you know, extremely concerned about it, but I'm not also not happy about it, obviously. And I was wondering what you thought about plant sterols and omelet powder and any other maybe uh, supplements or kind of a holistic, uh, you know, remedies that might lower it naturally. I'd I really don't feel like I want to be on a statin. Yeah. No, you're right. Such an important question. And I've got so many vegans with high cholesterols that I'm going to be doing a 20 minute video called beyond cholesterol on my website. I, hopefully I can get to it next week. Um, because of this very issue that you raised. And the gist of the video says this, listen, um, these plaques in the artery walls don't form just because your LDL is high. These are inflammatory lesions. These arteries are being injured by Joe six pack American running fried chicken and buffalo wings and pizzas and, uh, and uh, French fries and onion rings and all the free radical laden processed foods. That's what injures those arteries. Then the oxidized cholesterol from cooking the animal muscle penetrates into the wall through that injured endothelium and uh, gets into the wall of the artery and sets off the plaque formation. This is an active, ongoing inflammatory process. <clears throat> it, it, uh, just learning, knowing what your LDL is or your, your total cholesterol doesn't tell me if you've got that inflammatory fire burning in the walls of the arteries. If you don't, um, and you are truly plant-based. You know, if your inflammatory markers are negativo, if your HSCRP, oxidized cholesterol, myeloperoxidase, phospholipase, prostaglandin 2, the isoprostate, if those are all negative or low normal, then you don't have that inflammatory fire burning in the walls of your arteries. Even though your cholesterol is 208, every one of those cholesterol molecules were put there by your own liver for its own reasons, because for steroid synthesis, for testosterone synthesis, for uh, cell membrane metabolism, um, it's not a disease. That's not the, now Joe Sixpack, uh, who's eating meat, every, uh, one, every other one of those cholesterol molecules are cow cholesterol and chicken cholesterol and pig cholesterol. He's got a problem and his inflammatory markers are sky high uh, and he's gonna uh, develop the plaque in his artery walls. So that's why I'm making this video. All cholesterol, you know, all cholesterol molecules are not evil. And so, uh, so if you're a vegan with high cholesterol, one, make sure you, the rest of your diet's clean. You're not eating a bunch of processed junk uh, and fried foods and all that, even if they're vegan. And eat plenty of antioxidants, lots of dark green leafies. Um, and if you do that, trust your liver. It knows what it's doing. I, I certainly wouldn't go on statins. Should you... Um, uh, uh, be on amla and these things to pound that cholesterol down the plant sterols. You can, if you want to chase numbers, if it makes you sleep better at night, okay. But I do not, but I've not seen studies that people eating a true whole food plant-based diet with an elevated cholesterol are at high risk that these folks go on to develop heart attacks and strokes. All the studies that equate high cholesterols with heart attacks and strokes are done on populations of meat eating Americans. All these people are eating cheeseburgers and buffalo wings. Uh, and yeah, they have high cholesterols and yeah, they go on to get strokes. 
but they are a different breed of cat than the plant-based eater uh, whose liver is making the, its own uh, cholesterol. So in general, uh, to all my plant-eating folks with slightly elevated cholesterol, relax. Um, trust your liver. It knows what it's doing. Eat a clean diet and, um, and don't look in the rearview mirror. I, I don't think that's a disease of atherosclerosis but get those inflammatory markers checked. It'll be in my video on my website, but your doctor knows how these inflammatory markers, Quest and LabCorp orders them, get them checked. If you have any question, get an ultrasound scan of your carotid arteries. If they're clean as a whistle, there's no plaque, your inflammatory markers are low. It doesn't matter that your cholesterol is 208. Your liver has its own reasons for doing that, but it shouldn't, uh, shouldn't, you shouldn't lose any sleep over it. Got it, great, thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. Have a good day. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Clapper. Uh, we're almost ready. We, we, we do have time for one more question. Would you okay. mind? It'd be okay. Okay. Um, sure. I'm going to un, un, unmute Marianne. Um, here you go. This is the last question for the day. Thanks. Marianne, are you there? Marianne, Hello. You can there? you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. Hi, Dr. Clapper. I love your work. Thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you. Um, I've been SOS free for a year and feeling really healthy. I'm wondering, um, do you think cocoa powder is addictive? I like to use it in smoothies with dates and make oat bars with it. Yay, cocoa powder. I'm all for cocoa powder. You know, it should be as clean as possible and all that. But yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely fine. Uh, I mean, how much can you use? You know, it's, especially if it's unsweetened, it's pretty bitter stuff. So absolutely, throw it. I think it's got good antioxidant properties and all that stuff. Throw it in your smoothies. I think it's just fine. Not to worry at all about that. Thank you so much. I love you. <laughs> okay. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Well, that, 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 uh, Wraps it up for today. I can't thank you enough. Um, John's still caught in tech, but I think he's coming back now. Yep, I'm John, here. All right. All right. See ya. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Clapper, for that. Um, we appreciate you answering all of our, all the questions for us. Um, aside from that, I think everyone wants to say something to you too. So everyone, what do you have to say to Dr. Clapper? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.